Now, before we get to that and celebrate Newcastle, as always, I've got to tell you what has been happening in the news today and what I think about it. And surprise, surprise, climate change in part is where we are going to start. Now, regardless of your views or increasingly your beliefs about climate change, there are some people who are freaking nuts in this debate. There are people who, like Jeremy Corbyn, literally a policy that he announced in the UK election overnight, was that companies will be delisted from the stock exchange in the UK if they don't do enough to fight climate change. Seriously. There are people in this country who would like us to shut down the coal industry that would deeply affect areas like Newcastle and so many others. Of course, at the same time, it would send every single state in the country broke, because whether they like it or not, if you want, when you ring triple O for someone to be on the other end of the line, you need mining to make it happen. If you want to be able to turn the lights on to have an air conditioner in summer and a heater in winter that can be there and is always going to be there, then you're going to need coal-fired power. But still, there are those who fight it all the time. There are the idiots who try to pretend that bushfires are about climate change when, let's see how hard you've all been paying attention to the show in the past few weeks, 85% of all bushfires are started by human beings, 50% intentionally. But when you think things can't get any weirder, when the woke patrol can't get any more stern, enter the United Nations who are suggesting that one of the ways we can control climate change is to decide who's allowed to have babies and how many babies you're allowed to have. This was said in the past couple of days from a leader in the United Nations. South African governments don't like to talk about population control, but it is absolutely vital that we educate our governments and men and women on sensible approaches to population control. Otherwise, it will be hard to achieve many of the sustainable development goals. I repeat, the United Nations thinks the way to deal with climate change is to decide how many babies you should have. One person agrees. Now, this is one of those things where let's see whether the United Nations will follow this up or is it just for Western countries? Would it be for all African countries? Would it be? for India or China. But of course, when it comes to climate change, we know what China's doing. They, of course, are able to pollute at whatever rate they want until 2030. At the same time, the United Nations is saying, you can, you can't. Remember when Peter Costello used to say, have one for yourself and one for the country? Now the United Nations is saying, you can't have any. As for climate change and here in Australia, the Labor Party have decided to wheel out one of their great weapons that existed at the federal election, Chris Bowen. Do we remember Chris Bowen, the at times shadow treasurer who said to people who want to pay for their own retirement, if you don't like our policies, don't vote for us. And guess what happened? People didn't. So he's come out again and he is now trying to link his current portfolio as the shadow health minister to climate change. Have a look at what he has had to say today about why he believes that climate change is a health issue for Australia and Australian governments. Some have to put it, as some have put it rather, climate change is so dangerous to health that it threatens to unwind 50 years of progress in improving public health outcomes, as well as being able to uh, already have un unavoidable impacts of climate change. Now, in part, what is he talking about? He is talking about the Smog and smoke that has existed around places like Sydney and even a little bit here in Newey, which of course all comes from bushfires. Because remember, bushfires are all about climate change. Ah, that's right. 85% of bushfires are started by human beings. 50% on purpose. Remember what he said last time? If you don't like our policy, don't vote for it. Well, Chris, keep up the good work. As you know, uh, anything that we say here on TV uh, is something where you can, if you'd like to, and geez, don't the Greens like to, you can complain about it to a broadcasting authority. Conversely, if you don't like something that I say about you on television, you can go to court and file a defamation proceeding. Well, today, there was a massive move out of the federal government, where now Facebook and Twitter will have to be accountable for the endless defamation that happens on their platforms. No longer will they be able to be the people who say, 
well, we just make the pen and paper. We're not responsible for anything that gets set on it. Well, okay, what about cuckoo clock 69 with the little egg emoji that is there who is able to slander all day, every day? Well, you have to have an email to get the account. You can track down who that person is. What about people who are activists who like to slag off at anyone they possibly can with defamation being piled upon defamation and the full tearing apart of people's character? Well, Christian Porter had this to say today about how now Facebook and Twitter are publishers. That means the rules that apply to a newspaper now will apply to these multinationals. Do they get treated as publishers in a similar way to your organisation or a newspaper? That clearly is a complicated issue. My own personal view is that they should be treated in a very similar way right. to traditional publishers. But of course, you have issues about volume that you have to understand and that have to be accommodated. So there has to be a sensible, cautious approach to how you would okay. even that playing field. One of the biggest responses we've got to any political issues has happened in the past 24 hours, and it is in response to the Treasurer's comments about how people should be able to retrain and to work for as long as possible. Now, this is being misinterpreted by some, it's being beaten up by others, but the overall point is being defended by the Prime Minister, who said this today. Uh, what Joff Frydenberg has simply said is we want people to have more opportunities in the future about how they participate in the economy. What they want to do is up to them. And uh, we've got an ageing uh, uh, population in Australia, and I think people living longer, being more healthy, having more options is a good thing. It's a good thing for them, it's a good thing for our economy, and we want to have policies at federal and state levels that support people in the choices they want to make as they, as they age. Now, I don't think many people either watching or in this room tonight will have a problem with the idea of if you'd like to be able to work, you should be able to work. But here's the truth. As I've said, for multiple nights, over multiple weeks, for as long as I've had access to a television camera, the biggest ism that is actually a cancer across Australia is not sexism or racism, it is ageism. It is how we treat people over the age of 50. Now, many people in this room would know the experience about what it's like to try and get a job when you are of that age, but I just decided to make an offhand comment in, like, the last half hour of the show last night. It wasn't the thing I did at the very start of the show when the most number of people were watching. I just said, do you have an experience about this? Send me an email. Well, here's a flood of emails of people who want to work, try to work, but can't. Why? Because of ageism. Because people say, no not you. Have a look at just a sample of the emails that I've got to pmurray at skynews.com.au in the past 24 hours. Some of these will take a little time to read, but I want you to hear the stories, OK? David. I'm a 57-year-old male who has been out of real work for over four months. I've applied for around 30 to 40 jobs and I've only had eight replies, all negative. The others you just never hear from. The ones who I've managed to speak to say that you have too much experience. Alternatively, they say that the position is more junior than what you have done previously. My response is always, if I thought that, I wouldn't have applied in the first place. Yvonne, I had to leave work at the age of 63. I had an appointment with an employment agency. I was told at my age it was better and easier to have a doctor write a medical certificate to say I was not fit for work. That saved me from having to look for work, as they said it would be almost impossible for me to get a job at my age. I'm applying for some jobs, but can't even get past the first step. I miss work. Ilona says, I'm 57 and on a disability, and my hubby is my carer. He had a part-time job, which helped us pay $500 a fortnight for our rural home. Tax time, we find out, because he's over 65, and his uh, carer payment has classed as income, we have also incurred a tax debt. He needs to work part-time as it gives him a bit of time away from me. However, we just can't afford for him to keep getting tax debts, but we also can't live on just the pension. He has heaps to offer, but it works against us. Michael, I started work at 15 and have worked, including over 20 years in the Navy, until health issues in my late 50s caused me to retire from a management position. After a couple of years' break to recover, I applied for casual or part-time work with several retail outlets such as Bunnings and Woolworths, only to be turned down because I was overqualified. I trained to operate a forklift 
thinking it would help me, but they wanted younger men in those roles. Now I'm in my 60s, until recently, still trying, I've given up on re-entering the workforce. And finally, Steve says, I've worked my whole life from 15, now 61, as a tradesperson, but 10 years ago, I made the effort to get off the tools and into other positions. I've had to apply for jobs that were the same as what I was currently doing, but since I hadn't even got past the initial, we have had your, we have, uh, app, your, we, sorry, we will look at your application because of your age. This goes on and on and on and on. So, we have a law that says you can't knock back somebody for a job because of who they love. We have laws in this country that say you can't knock back someone because of their religion. We have laws in this country that say you can't use as an excuse for why you don't give somebody a job because of their gender. Now, they'll tell you that we have laws that say you can't give someone, you can't knock back somebody a job because of their age. But how can it be an excuse? Sorry, you don't get the job because you're overqualified for the position. As these people say, they know what they're applying for. And the truth is, is that people over the age of 50 have got a lot of life left to live and a lot of bills still to pay. Because our banking system means that people borrow money in their 20s, or maybe if, like me, it took a long time to get your stuff together, into your 30s. And the expectations are that you will be able to slowly but surely pay that loan off. Well, increasingly, when people used to retire of their own volition in their 60s, they are now being made redundant in their 50s and even turned down in their 40s. Age discrimination. Ageism is the ism that is truly a cancer in Australia. Julian Assange is going to make his way out of jail, well, at least for the accusations about sexual assault that took place in Sweden, as the Australian newspaper wrote today, that uh, Swedish authorities have dropped their rape accusations into the WikiLeaks founder because of a near decade delay has weakened evidence about bringing any prosecution. So I know this will annoy a few of you, but for those of you who now say that uh, Julian Assange is a free man and innocent, no, he just waited out the process and, of course, never had the balls to actually go and confront his accusers. In the US, in the middle of the night, and almost all the way through to lunchtime today, the impeachment nonsense was continuing on. And look, everyone's in their corners on this. If you hate Trump, you secretly hope that this is all going to fall into the lap of the gods. But if, like me, you can see common sense, or even more like me, you like Trump, you can see that this is an absolute stitch-up. Remember, the President of the United States, be it good or bad, can set the foreign policy of his or her nation. It's not up to the underlings to agree or disagree with it, it's up to them to carry it out. Statescraft means that, yes, you do deals. For example, you say to North Korea, you have to stop building bombs and then you get to meet me. When it comes to Iran, if you stop building bombs, then we'll give you money. But if Donald Trump tries to do anything about trying to have a look into a company that hired the, former, the, the, the son of the former vice president and most likely Democrat nominee for 2020, Joe Biden, that's a crime. Here's what happened today in the States. Ambassador Volker, have you ever seen military aid held up because the president wanted his rival investigated? No, I have not seen that. Have you ever seen that, Mr. Morrison? No, Chairman. Committee Chairman Adam Schiff hit back against Republicans who said the hearings were a flop. But Congressman Jim Jordan criticized Democrats. You two guys who are here telling it straight, you've both decided you're going to step out of government because of what these guys are doing. Former NSC official Tim Morrison, however, warned both parties about paralyzing partisanship. I understand the gravity of these proceedings, but I beg you not to lose sight of the military conflict underway in eastern Ukraine today. Special Envoy to Ukraine Kurt Volker says he thought an investigation into the Bidens and gas company Burisma were distinct. He says an investigation into Burisma itself would be appropriate, but not the Bidens. I think the, the allegations against Vice President Biden are self-serving and not credible. President Trump says the hearings are a scam by Democrats. They're using this impeachment hoax for pol their own political gain to try and damage the Republican Party and damage the president. 
All of that starts again about one o'clock in the morning Australian Eastern Daylight Time. You will find out all of it again tomorrow with Laura and Pete in first edition. And just finally, before we get into a celebration of Newcastle and we meet some of my favourite llamas, I can tell you that there is a new form of lefty crazy. As we know, everything is sexist, everything is terrible. God forbid you're holding your uh, non-same-sex partner's hand right now. But did you know that apparently... Your thermostat in your home, the temperature under which you have the heater or the air conditioner, is sexist. Let me explain. According to The Guardian, surprise, surprise, according to a new study conducted by the researchers of Ohio State University, a lot of households co uh, uh, contain a thermostat dictator who rules the temperature dial with an iron fist. As it turns out, there is a gendered nature to this. The thermostat dictator is normally a man. Yes, apparently who decides how hot or cold it is is an example of how sexist your house can be. Honestly. Remember they used to five years ago go on about first world problems? What sort of made up sookery is that sort of garbage? Oh, that's right, it's in The Guardian. Does that surprise you?